Hello everyone and welcome to another Age of Empires Foreign History video. Today we are going to take a look at another new civilization made available with the new expansion of Age of Empires IV, the Sultan's Ascent. These masters of strategy bring a new twist to the battlefield of Age of Empires IV, with aqueduct networks, a legion of mercenaries fueled by olive oil, and even Greek fire. It's time to immerse ourselves in history and dominate with the Byzantines. Let the epic battles begin! In Age of Empires IV, the civilization of the Byzantines covers roughly from the 9th century to the 15th century. This video, however, is gonna be a little bit different from the other videos, from the past videos, as the landmarks of the Byzantines, they don't follow a timeline that we can just go through from Dark to Imperial Age. Instead, the landmarks are just like very old buildings or very important structures. But before we dive into the heart of Age of Empires IV, let's go back a bit in time to the roots of the Byzantine Empire. The formation of the Byzantine Empire can be traced back to the division of the Roman Empire. In 285, the Emperor Diocletian initiated a major restructuring of the Roman Empire, dividing it into the Western and the Eastern Roman Empires. And the main goal of this division was to facilitate administration and defenses against external threats. In 324, the Emperor Constantine the Great decided to refound Byzantium after his victory in a nearby battle, the Battle of Chrysopolis. And with that, he renamed the city to New Rome, or Nova Roma. However, that name didn't really stick, and the city was soon known as the City of Constantine, or Constantinople. And the founding of Constantinople was not really just a strategic decision, it was also Symbolic. Constantine envisioned the city as a new Rome and a Christian capital, in a way to give continuation to the Roman legacy. The former Byzantium city's location facilitated trade, defenses, and even cultural exchange, making it a flourishing hub that would become synonymous with the Byzantine Empire. During this time, however, also the Byzantine faced many external threats, in special the Abbasid caliphate. These two powers engaged many times, with multiple wins and losses for both sides, and these conflicts are known as the Byzantine-Arab Wars. Now, in the game, this civilization has access to many new bonuses, like the olive oil, a fifth resource available only to the Byzantine Empire, stone income from constructed buildings, mangonel emplacements for keeps and towers, and the access to cisterns and aqueducts unique buildings available only to them. Throughout the Byzantine Empire history, the use of stone for construction was a notable characteristic of this empire. They were renowned for their impressive architectural achievements, including the construction of grand churches, fortifications, and monumental structures. But why stone in particular? Most likely, stone was chosen for construction due to its strength and durability. For example, in a military context, a stone fortification is much stronger than a wooden tower. And this Stone fortifications actually contributed a lot to the capacity of this empire to withstand siege, something that happened a lot throughout the history of the Byzantine, of Constantinople. Constantinople was constantly at siege. In the game, this gameplay mechanic of receiving stone every time a building is built with this civilization could be a reflection of the historical importance of stone to the Byzantine architecture. Constantinople had an insufficient supply of of water and relied deeply on aqueducts. Do not drink urine or sea water. The first aqueduct system built in the city was the Valens Aqueduct, built between 337 and 373. For you to have an idea of how big this was, before the 7th century, more than 200 cisterns were built in the city, including both above ground and underground, by the way. Cisterns and aqueducts can also be built in the game, starting from Dark Age. Costing initially 50 stone, the cost after that increases by additional 50 
150 stone up to 300 stone cost. These cisterns start at water level 1 and each additional cistern connected increases the water level by 1, but 5 is the maximum level even though you can build a limited amount of non-overlapping cisterns. Cisterns increase the gather rate of nearby villagers depending on the water level, starting at 5%, each water level increases the bonus by another 5%, and the cisterns also generate an influence bonus area and buildings within that area get different bonuses that can be switched by the player, like the Conscriptio, which produces military units faster. The Conscriptio refers to a system of compulsory military service, or conscription. It was a way to gather manpower during times of need, like during wars or invasions. Now, the Dialectus activates a research bonus and the research is faster depending also on the water level. Dialectus in Latin refers to someone skilled in dialectics and in a historical context it played a very important role in philosophy. And the last one, the Praesidium, gives the buildings nearby or under that influence a defensive bonus so that these buildings take less damage. And of course it also depends on the water level, how much less damage the buildings take. Praesidium in Latin is closely associated with defense and protection. And historically, it can refer to any kind of defensive position, stance, fortress, garrison, or any kind of protection against external forces. Additionally, the system has a special ability that can be activated in times of need. The Agritoid defense can be activated and villagers within the radius gain a spear to attack and plus 2 melee and ranged armor for 30 seconds. The term Akritoi referred to frontier soldiers who defended the Byzantine Empire's eastern borderlands. The Akritoi were a very unique group of soldiers and they played a very important role in defending the empire, especially against the Arab and Persian forces. And the soldiers were often stationated in the border regions, which were also called Akritai. Now, a system can be connected to another one using aqueducts. And something else if you have good city planning skills, you can even benefit from multiple bonuses at the same time. Now, in Dark Age, you can start producing the Limitane, a unique variant of the Spearmen. They have more hit points and have the Shield Wall ability, which puts them under a defensive stance, reducing incoming range damage. These Spearmen are by far the strongest Spearmen in the game, as they are good against their counters. The real Limitane were an important part of the late Roman and early Byzantine army. And this band garrisoned fortifications along the borders of the empire and actually they were not even expected to fight in wars, like in the middle of the battlefield, they weren't there. But sometimes they would. These soldiers were introduced in the 3rd or the 4th century as professional soldiers and they could be as infantry or cavalry. But after the 5th century they were actually just part-time soldiers. But it got worse, after the 6th century they literally were just unpaid militia. I'm not a soldier, really. But anyway, with that we have covered Dark Age and now we can advance to the Feudal Age. And to do that, we can of course build our landmarks. The Imperial Hippodrome. It's a military landmark that acts as a stable and contains the Triumph ability. When the Triumph ability is activated, it boosts all cavalry by increasing their movement speed by 10%, damage by 25% and grants them regeneration of 2 HP per second. The duration of However, depends on the number of supply points collected at the landmark, either just with time or by killing units. This landmark is based on the Hippodrome of Constantinople. Today the area is a square in Istanbul, known as the Sultan Ahmed Square. The tracks have been paved, however they can still be found around 2 meters below the surface. The Hippodrome is commonly associated with the city's days of glory, but it actually was built by Emperor Septimius Severus around 203 current era, when the city was still called Byzantium. One one of the major undertakings of Constantine after the foundation of Constantinople was the renovation of the Hippodrome. He made it bigger and capable of holding up to a hundred thousand spectators. The place was filled with works of art and statues of gods and animals and people used to spend a lot of money betting on chariot races. 
Nowadays, a portion of the curved end is still visible, but most of the hippodrome's remains still lie beneath this park, undiscovered, uninvestigated and not taken care of. The Grand Winery landmark is an economic landmark that acts as a monastery. Yep, you heard it right. You can garrison relics in this landmark and produce monks from it, but it's not a religious landmark, it's an economic one. Because there's a catch. Instead of gold, relics garrisoned in this landmark are going to give you olive oil. Olive oil is the fifth resource available only to the Byzantine civilization and villagers gather olive oil from berries, shoreline fish and groves besides food. Olive oil was super important for the empire's economy and Constantinople was a hub for trade due to its location. The strong economy attracted soldiers from distant lands looking for new opportunities, new adventures. And because of that, the Byzantine army frequently employed foreign army forces, soldiers, the so-called mercenary troops. And that's something we get access to in a feudal age as well. But anyway, back to the landmark. This landmark grants villagers within its radius above of 6 60% olive oil gathering rate from berry bushes and olive groves. The farm's replacement, by the way. This landmark is most probably based on the Zayrak Mosque, also known as the Monastery of the Pantocrator, made up of two former Byzantine churches and a chapel joined together. The first structure of the complex, a monastery, was built by the Byzantine Empress Irene of Hungary between 1118 and 1124, dedicated to Chris Pantocrator, Chris the Omnipotent. The monastery consisted of a church, a library and a hospital. And from there, the complex slowly grew into the structure that we see today. This monastery complex represents the best example of Middle Byzantine architecture in Constantinople and it's the second largest Byzantine religious structure still standing in Istanbul, surpassed only by Hagia Sophia. Now that we are in the feudal age, we have access to the mercenary house. This building produces mercenary units in exchange for olive oil after a contract is purchased and only one contract can be purchased per game for per in the match and these mercenary houses can also be placed near neutral trade posts to e produce even more unique units but they are kind of random and they are defined at the beginning of the match and these units are also produced 33% faster. Another unique unit that becomes available in the feudal age is the Shado Siphon which we don't know how to pronounce announce, so I'm gonna call it Fire Ramp. This unit is a ranged siege engine that attacks at close range and shoots Greek fire, dealing damage to anything that is caught in the blazes. The real Shado Siphon, or Fire Ram, was actually a handheld Greek fire device, like a flamethrower. Greek fire, however, was mostly used on water to set enemy ships on fire. And the composition of the Greek fire remains a matter of speculation and debate up to this day. It's mentioned that during the siege of Delium in 424, a large tube on wheels was used to blow flames forward with large bellows. I think that is something like what we see in Age of Empires 4 but without the bellows. Maybe the soldiers themselves, they just blow the thing forward. But anyway, the Greek fire, the proper Greek fire that we are talking about, was invented around 672, and its invention is attributed to Kalinikos, a Greek engineer from Heliopolis, and talking about Greek fire, the Dromon ship is also available starting in feudal age, which is a ship with Greek fire. And now that we are done with feudal age, we can go move on to the castle age, and to do that we can build the following landmarks. The Goldhorn Tower produces batches of mercenary units randomly, but only those unlocked with a contract in the mercenary house or from the trade post with a mercenary house nearby. This landmark's real-life counterpart is the Galata Tower. This is an old Genoese tower located in Constantinople, nowadays known as Istanbul. A previous tower built in the 6th century in the same place was destroyed during the Fourth Crusade in 1204, but in 1267 a Genoese colony was established and the new tower, the Galata Tower, was built at the highest point as the Tower of Christ. And at the time, this watchtower was the tallest building in the city. 
The cistern of the first hill is an economic landmark that functions as a cistern, but provides the pilgrim flask healing ability to all non siege units. It's also possible to choose between manual and automatic healing. When a unit is low HP, all we gotta do is gulp. Pilgrim flasks have a long history and are often associated with pilgrimages. They were designed to be easy to carry, light, and were commonly used to transport holy water, olive oil, or any other type of sacred or religious substance. This landmark is based on the Basilica Cistern. The subterranean cistern was called Basilica because it was located under a large public square, the Stoa Basilica, on the first hill of Constantinople. Prior to its construction, a great basilica stood on the spot. Constantinople, or now known as Istanbul, has seven hills. The first hill is the location of the original Greek settlement of Byzantium. And now in Castle Age, we have access to new, unique units. For example, the cataphract. The cataphract is a heavy melee cavalry unit resistant against counter cavalry units. This unit replaces the traditional knight, it's stronger, however, it's more expensive and slower. These cavalry units have the trample ability, allowing them to deal area damage to nearby units and charge into enemy forces, ignoring other units on the way. A cataphract was a form of heavy armored cavalry, originated in Persia. Both the horse and the rider were almost completely covered with a scaled armor. And this heavy cavalry were used mainly to break opposing cavalry forces. And many civilizations deployed cataphracts in, at some point in their history, including but not limited to the Mongols, Koreans, the Chinese, the Romans and the Byzantines. Another unique unit is the Varangian Guard, a heavy melee infantry unit that replaces the traditional men-at-arms. But they have more damage and melee armor. They also have an ability called Berserking that swaps their weapons to two-handed weapons and deal plus six damage for 30 seconds, but at the same time it decreases their armor by 4. These units can also build transport ships and increase melee and ranged armor of any transport by 1 for each unit garrisoned. So imagine a ram carrying 5 of those dudes. Whose idea was this? <laughs> Ah! The Varangian Guard was actually a type of elite soldiers present in the Byzantine army from the 10th to the 14th century, and they acted as personal bodyguards to the emperors. Their forces were mainly composed of recruits from Northern Europe, mainly Norsemen from Scandinavia. The emperor didn't trust Byzantine guardsmen that much, as their loyalty would often switch and change. So, employing foreign forces seemed like a better choice, more a safer choice. And after that, immigrants from Scandinavia, like Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, they started to form the bulk of the Varangian Guard. In fact, so many men left Sweden to enlist to the Varangian Guard that to stop this crazy emigration, a medieval Swedish law established that no one could inherit while living or staying in Greece. And that's how the Scandinavian called the Byzantine Empire, by the way. But in any case, the men not only protected the emperor, but also would take part in war. Berserkers in Old Norse were those who were said to have fought in a trance-like fury, or violent, furiously out of control. And finally, to reach the imperial age, we can choose between the Palatine School and the Foreign Engineering Company. The Foreign Engineering Company is a military landmark, a nest of bees, hui hui Pau and royal cannons are available to be purchased there with olive oil. I suppose they also need to be lubricated with the oil. And the Palatine School is a military landmark that has 30% chance to spawn copies of the unique Byzantine units made. Meaning, every time a Limitane, Varangian Guard or Cataphract is trained, there's a chance to get the same units for free from this landmark. 
Now, both the Palatin School and the Foreign Engineering Company, they have the same general shape and outline, but the Palatin School has a more traditional Byzantine architecture, while the Foreign Engineering Company has elements from other civilizations, like the Chinese roof or the Mongol tents, little details like that. And in Imperial Age, we get access to the Wonder. The Byzantine's Wonder is called the Cathedral of Divine Wisdom and is based on the Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia was built by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I as the Christian Cathedral of Constantinople for the Byzantine Empire around 537. Originally, it was called Church of God's Holy Wisdom, and it remained the world's largest cathedral for nearly a thousand years. So as you can see, we have the landmarks, the wonder, they were built in different periods of time, everything is a little bit mixed up. So from here, I'm going to wrap up everything with an overview view of the most relevant events that led to the end of this empire. So let's imagine for a second that we find ourselves in the 11th century. Tensions between the Roman church based in Rome and the Byzantine church based in Constantinople start to rise. Religious disagreements like if a certain bread can be used during communion, celibacy or the wording used in the Nicene Creed led to the the great schism and also Rome believed that the Pope should have absolute authority over the religious entities of the Eastern Church but Constantinople was like Mm -mm, not here. They just disagreed. They didn't want to submit to the Pope. And all these little things, or big things, led to the mutual excommunication of these two churches. First, the Pope excommunicated the Eastern Church and everything that comes along with it. And in retaliation, the Eastern Church excommunicated the Roman Church because everyone can do whatever they want, I guess. And that was the great schism of of 1054 when officially these two churches broke apart from each other and then we have the orthodox church and the roman church but despite all this disagreement something more important was rising and that was the Islam. And these two great powers, they had to hold hands and fight together if they wanted to survive. The growing forces of the Seljuk Turks forced the Emperor Alexius to ask the Pope for help to protect their Christian lands. After all, they are still all Christians. And by 1087, Jerusalem, for example, had already been taken. And with that, the Pope called for the First Crusade in 1095. And by convincing any Christian that taking the cross and joining the crusade would clean them from their sins and they would be greatly rewarded, the Pope managed to group almost or to send to, to aid Constantinople almost 60,000 men, crusaders. And this first crusade was a success, they managed to protect Constantinople. And not just that, but also some lands were retaken. But that was not enough. The Second Crusade, launched in 1147, was a disaster. The intention of expanding the Christian lands by taking Edessa from the Seljuk was actually not very clear to the Crusaders and once they were there, they didn't know what to do. They were just like, uh, no... So it was a disaster, they didn't know what to do, where to go to, and with that, many of the lands that were recovered were lost again. The Third Crusade, launched in 1189, also had the main objective of recovering the city, the holy city of Jerusalem, which by then had already been taken by the Ayyubid's Muslim ruler, Saladin. But in any case, this Third Crusade was also a disaster and super demoralizing, just a failure. And yet, another crusade started in 1202 to retake Jerusalem. Well, by now you must be asking, but why the hell are you even talking about this? What's the point, right? Well, first because the Crusades is one of the main topics of this new expansion from Age of Empires IV, the Sultan's Ascent. And by explaining this to you, I am kind of connecting the dots what Byzantines have to do with the Crusades. And second, although the main objective of this Fourth Crusade was to retake Jerusalem, in a disturbing twist, the 
real target ended up being none other than Constantinople. And this event had profound and devastating consequences to the fate of the Byzantine Empire. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I'm doing I'm gonna try to give like a brief overview of what happened, why they changed their main objective, why they attacked the city. The crusaders were facing some financial difficulties and they also were lacking manpower. So they formed alliance with the Venetians and the Venetians were already, you know, having some problems with the Byzantine Empire. They were not really happy about it, about the Byzantines, but they accepted to help the crusaders um, to go to Jerusalem to protect the Christian lands and even reinforce Constantinople and reinstitute a former emperor that promised all these people a lot of money back and if they helped him. However, uh, and things just didn't go well. Constantinople just didn't want this new emperor. They didn't want him, so it didn't work. And in the end, the emperor had no money to pay for the crusaders or the Venetians. And what happened? Well, they decided to take the city by force force. And with that, the city suffered extensive looting, destruction and violence. Sir Stephen Runsman, a historian of the Crusades, wrote that this event was unparalleled in history. And I'm gonna show you a text that he wrote and if you're interested, you can pause to read it. It's really shocking and really sad. In the sacking of the city weakened the empire economically, militarily and culturally. Many treasures and cultural artistic monuments were completely destroyed or looted. For example, the Hippodrome. It was destroyed during the Fourth Crusade and it never recovered from that. And the events of this Fourth Crusade left a lasting legacy of resentment and bitterness among Orthodox Christians towards the Catholic West. And the wounds inflicted during the sack of Constantinople lingered for centuries. Overall, the Fourth Crusade had a disastrous impact on Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire, hastening the empire's decline and contributing to the complex historical and religious dynamics of the Eastern Mediterranean. And these events also allowed other forces, other neighbors, to start gaining influence, like the Ottoman Turks. Although Constantinople was retaken in 1261, the empire lost many of its key economic resources and struggled to survive. Plus, the cherry on top of the cake, the constant conflict with the Ottoman Turks led to the final destruction of the Byzantine Empire. The final blow came in 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire, led by Sultan Mehmed II. After a 53-day siege, the Ottomans stormed into Constantinople, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire and the beginning of the Ottoman era. And if you're interested in knowing more about the Ottoman civilization, which is also in Age of Empires 4, you know, the civilizations are connected. If you're interested in that, I also have a video on the Ottomans. I'm gonna leave it here in the bubble so you can just go ahead and check it out. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I think this was a good one and long one. I really hope you enjoyed. Hope you can take something, you learn something new and as always, please, if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel for my videos like this and to support me and don't forget to give that thumbs up to the video and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye!